Conventional education stifles curiosity and promotes conformity. It originated from the Prussian model designed to create obedient workers. Industrialists like J.D. Rockefeller wielded significant influence and control over the system. Schools bear a striking resemblance to factories, prioritizing discipline over genuine learning. The existence of standard schools is a result of historical developments rather than inherent necessity. Forced repetition and punishment were employed to shape children's compliance. As J.D. Rockefeller puts it, and I quote, I don't want a nation of thinkers. I want a nation of workers. Teach them everything about nothing. John D. Rockefeller was the inventor of the K-12 education system. And it's funny because for some reason, people will still defend their ignorance by telling you how qualified they are and the universities that they went to. But you go talk to kindergartners, our first grade kids, and you will find a class full of science enthusiasts. They will ask deep questions. Questions like, what is a dream? Why do we have toes? Why is the moon round? What is the birthday of the world? Why is grass green? These are profound, important questions. But you go talk to 12th graders and there's none of that. Because they have become incurious. Something terrible has happened between kindergarten and 12th grade. The history of education in Jamaica is perhaps best understood in the context of the island's colonial past. The education system and its administration were fashioned after the British system, and many of the developments in history of the Jamaican education can be seen as responses to events such as abolition of slavery in 1834, the advent of suffrage in 1944, and the achievement of independence in 1962. Much of the recent history of education in Jamaica has been driven by the perceived need to develop homegrown responses to economic, social, and political pressures on the island and in the Caribbean region. Before we go further, I would like to say thank you to every one of my subscribers, supporters, and visitors to Elite Jamaica. You are all valued. And for all of those who have been repeatedly asking about how to donate to the channel, please look in the description for links. A huge thank you to all of you. Please know that you are appreciated. Elite Jamaica Before the Act of Emancipation went into effect in 1834, there appears to have been little in the way of a formal education system for whites and no system for educating indigenous people and the slaves. White colonists who could afford it sent their sons back to the mother country for schooling, while others hired private tutors. Those who were less affluent sent their sons to one of the few free schools that were established through bequests from wealthy planters and the merchants. The curriculum in the free schools was based on that offered by similar schools in Great Britain and was intended to offer a classical education to young gentlemen so that they would be properly fitted to take their place in society. A few slave children received some schooling at plantation schools established by foreign missionaries, but their education dealt mostly with religion and the virtues of submission. There is little documented about the education of girls in the colony before 1770, when Ulmer's Free School initiated a modified curriculum for girls that was designed to prepare them for running a home or for employment as seamstresses and mantua makers. Once slavery was abolished in 1834, the British saw education as an important way to integrate ex-slaves into the colonial economy and to ensure a peaceful lower class. In the years following emancipation, missionary societies developed a system of elementary education for the newly freed slaves. This system was taken over by the colonial government beginning in the 1860s. Schooling emphasized the skills that would prepare children for eventual employment as estate workers. Elementary curriculum focused on reading, writing, and arithmetic, with some religious training and occasional geography and history instruction. In addition, boys were given training in agriculture and other manual arts, and girls received lessons in sewing and domestic science. 
These separate tracks for boys and girls were formalized in the Lomb Report of 1898. The report emphasized the need for agricultural training in order to counteract trends seen as threatening to the colonial economy and society. Students were developing a distaste for manual labor and were moving from the countryside to the cities and towns to take up clerkship and other similar occupations. The school system continued to expand at the beginning of the 20th century, but nonetheless continued to be guided by the 19th century colonial practice of educating children to fit their station in life. As the relative number of British people in Jamaica began to decrease, it became necessary to move native Jamaicans into certain intermediate occupations, and this resulted in growth in the secondary school system and the creation of government scholarships for university study abroad. Elementary schools began to hold annual scholarship examinations in order to allow some children who would not have been able to afford the fees to attend secondary school. Birchell Whiteman, former Minister of Education and Culture of Jamaica, characterizes these movements as the beginnings of the struggle to change the secondary schools from being comprised of students with the ability to pay to students with the ability to benefit from the education offered. During the 1930s, economic pressures associated with the Depression and the colonial system in general resulted in widespread unemployment among Jamaicans. This coupled with chronically low wages and endemic poverty and with the growing desire among Jamaicans for self-rule led to the formation of groups such as the Jamaica Workers and the Tradesmen Union in 1934 and the People's National Party in 1938. Mass protests and marches among the working poor and the unemployed became common and frequently ended in rioting. The British responded with the Ard Brown inquiry into the labour conditions in the colony and the formation of the West India Royal Commission under Lord Moyne, which was charged with inquiring into the social, economic and educational conditions underlying the unrest. The Candell Report and the Associated Plan for Post-Primary Education in Jamaica of 1943 to 1944 addressed the educational, social and economic conditions of the colony once again. It focused on establishing a system of post-primary education so as to ameliorate the existing harsh, socially segregated education with its class and color configurations. The report and plan also addressed curricula at the secondary level, establishing a common literary core for both boys and girls and further solidifying the gendered vocational training tracks originally formalized in the Lomb Report in 1997. Much of the reform and restructuring that took place from this time up until independence is described by Sherlock and Bennett in 1998 as a period of tutelage in which what was granted as diluted self-government in doses graduated to suit the imperial interests. There was much to do because the colonial system of education bred a lack of self-confidence among blacks in their own ability to manage their own affairs. As part of the general trend toward the self-sufficiency of the island and of the whole British Caribbean, the University of the West Indies, UA, was founded in 1948 at Mona, Jamaica. This was an important step in establishing educational independence because Jamaica had been forced to import university graduates from Great Britain to serve as senior staff in secondary schools. The birth of the Department of Education at UA in 1952 was a major step toward a completely homegrown educational system. The processes leading toward self-rule and eventual independence for Jamaica were accelerated by the complex events and forces that arose during and after World War II. Sherlock and Bennett argued that the rejection of Nazi anti-Semitism and Aryan superiority led the British to see as untenable the concepts of empire and of the trusteeship of a superior race. The Jamaican constitution was revised in 1944 to grant voting rights to all adults and the British also started the process of ending colonial economic exploitation by setting up a colonial development fund. The Moyne Report's conclusions with regard to education noted that a lack of central control over the primary schools resulted in inefficiency in administration. It also pointed out that there was a lack of correspondence between the school's curricula and the needs of those living in Jamaica. 
The report recommended, among other things, that the curriculum be modified to include courses in health and hygiene, that preschools be established even though many community-based preschools already existed, and the Reverend Ward recently had addressed the government on this matter, that schools be organized into levels primary for 6 to 12-year-olds and junior for 12 to 15-year-olds, and that schools be brought up to modern standards with respect to buildings, sanitation, water purity, and school equipment. It is generally agreed that the Moyne Report also contributed impetus toward the granting of universal adult suffrage and limited self-rule in the colony. Frederick T. Gates, a business advisor to J.D. Rockefeller, stated, and I quote, We shall not try to make these people or any of their children into philosophers or men of learning or of science. We are not to raise up among them authors, orators, poets, or men of letters. We shall not search for great artists, painters, or musicians. End quotes. So guess what, people? It's time for a reality check. We need to start properly educating the coming generations. Because the more educated you become, the better choices you have. Period. I am certainly proof of that, and I speak from personal experience. The choices I made after school were the ones that opened up my world to more possibilities. Regardless of what happens with education in this country, the intelligent will continue to survive. So it is my belief that if we don't do something, the illiterate of the 21st century will not be those who cannot read and write, but rather those who cannot unlearn and relearn. So we need to reform our public school system or try some homeschooling. We need to encourage the latest generation of Jamaica to put down the smartphones and pick up books. We need to turn this nation of workers back into a nation of thinkers before it's too late. Thank you so much for watching.